Amen. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Amen. Brother Harris, would you ask the Lord to bless our service, please? Praise the Lord. Pastor John provided us with an excellent example and uh, a good introduction to what is our final lesson on our section regarding uh, the Spirit and the Lord's moving, uh, because this morning we're talking about victory. Our title is Victory in Jesus, and we have been looking at the spiritual realm, uh, the power of God, and how important that is for each and every one of us, uh, we live in a natural realm. Our bodies are natural. The things around us that we see are natural and uh, have time limits. Uh, but we, as God's people, are aware that God is a spirit. And so, therefore, we must worship him, as the scripture tells us, in spirit and in truth. And through the spirit, we can um, plug into, grab a hold of, uh, many, many things that are very special. And through God's Spirit, we can have victory. So this morning, we are looking um, at, uh, we'll take a look at four different sections in all in the New Testament. And they all have to do with uh, not only our need for victory in Jesus, uh, but it touches on the things that we have to do in order for that victory to be realized. Um, and this is, you know, and as, as Pastor John spoke, and we're all aware, we're in a very um, precarious time. Um, we are in a time that the scripture speaks of. And uh, so it's really, for me, and, and I trust for you as well, it's kind of, you know, the old saying, it's where the rubber hits the road. It's where we recognize and we have to see now and dig deep into ourselves and say, okay, perhaps I've carried the label of a Christian and I've said I'm a Christian, uh, but now you know what? It's time to actually be a Christian and to um, do what Scripture tells us to do and to be able to ac access the power of God because in our own might and in our own power, uh, we are powerless. Uh, there, there's only so much that we can do. And as you can see in the world around us today, and I'm sure even if we had a friendly conversation now amongst ourselves, there are different opinions. There are people who feel that something should be done uh, then or in the future or other things should happen now and other people say no. Um, but the wheels are turning. And by that I mean... Uh, things are happening around us. Um, one of the things that I just, uh, before we look in uh, 2 Corinthians, one of the things that, that I just find um, both troubling and it, I think it speaks a little bit to human nature and I fall prey to it myself. Um, you know, as uh, you flip to a channel on your television or you listen on the radio or whatever and you can witness, as Pastor John said, what is happening in a country uh, around the world and the other side of the planet, basically, and, and uh, in, in real time, you can see what's happening. I, I pray that we have empathy uh, and that we don't lose touch with that reality because it's so very easy to flip the channel. And then, let's see, yesterday I, you can watch uh, people dying and you can watch uh, the fighting and people leaving and then you can flip the channel and you can see a tennis tournament. And then you can flip the channel and you can watch a soccer game. Uh, and you can flip the channel and you can watch whatever. 
Um, and you know, and as I was doing so, I, I, I thought, okay, here's a stadium full of people watching this soccer game, and somewhere else at this very moment, there are people dying. There are people losing everything that they have um, at a moment's notice, and as Pastor John said, with a small bag perhaps or whatever, um, leaving everything behind and often leaving uh, members of family behind uh, because uh, they can't leave and, and uh, who knows if they will see each other again. Uh, you know, we, we live in this time when you better make sure, I better make sure, you better make sure that you are right with the Lord. Just before church, I often I check my email and uh, the latest um, news report is that Putin has put his nuclear arsenal on standby. Now, I don't know about you, that scares me. Uh, I don't like the sound of that at all. Um, but, as Pastor John said, when you're dealing with someone who is demon-possessed, when you're de dealing with Satan, who doesn't care about the value of anyone's life. I mean, to do anything that foolish we would look at it, I look at it, and say that's absolutely ridiculous because you know there's going to be a response. And then the dominoes start to fall and, and who knows what's left over when the dust settles. But, you know, for anyone to do that, I, I would say you have to be insane. You have to be possessed. And so the battle that we face today that you and I, that we can participate in today. See, there's something that God's people can do that I believe, if the Lord is willing and merciful, can make a difference. And that is that we can go to battle on the spiritual front. Okay? And Scripture tells us, so turn with me to 2 Corinthians 10, and we'll start at verse 1. You know, that there are going to be battles. You know, and every one of us faces battles. We face trials. You know, I don't have to tell you that. We face it emotionally. We have um, medical trials and tests. You'll notice I'm coughing a little bit again. Um, so my sinuses are going bananas again. And then that goes down into my lungs. Um, and, uh, you know, like we all have, you know, I, I think about, you know, the thorn in the flesh. You know, there's something there that's constantly, we have to be asking the Lord for help. You know, and so I go to prayer, and then I go to action and try and do, uh, you know, what I can to help with that. But ultimately, I need the Lord, right, to, to touch my body so that I don't need to do, you know, take the medication or whatever it happens to be. But that's all in God's hands as well. But He expects us to pray. And that's on a spiritual battlefront, right? Because when, this, when Satan comes to you individually, or he comes into the world in a, a blatant way, like we see going on right now, he's out to hurt. He's out to discourage. He's out to trouble people. Um, you know, and, and while we sometimes, uh, you know, go through our lives very quickly, and you know the days go by, boom, 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 Right? Um, people around us, we don't have to look across the ocean. People around us are going through trials and tests, perhaps in your own family, and certainly we know within our spiritual family. Uh, you know, and so if you take the time to think about those people and recognize that perhaps you can do something physically, and that's good, right? Write a card, um, send a meal. Uh, whatever you can, those kind of things. We're supposed to do those things, but we must not neglect the spiritual battle. And that's sometimes the one that's easiest to sort of shelve a little bit, right? Um, and the Bible tells us that we must not do that. We have to keep praying. And the longer the battle goes on, the danger is that we become weary. And that's why, see... Everything that's in the Bible, there's a reason that it's there. And so when Scripture tells us not to grow weary in well-doing, that's because God knew that there are going to be some long-haul battles. 
right? It's not just going to be one minute or one hour or one day or even a week. There are going to be long battles. But we have to ask God to help us and we have to be sincere in our desire to hold on. Brother Burka jumps into my heart and mind right now. And if you've spoken to him lately, you know, if you stop and think, this was Christmas when this started for him. That's two months. Okay? Two months. He and his wife have been going through this trial and through this test. Uh, and the Lord has helped them. Don't get me wrong. Right? But their battle isn't over. Because you'll notice we still haven't seen them. And uh, Stephanie and I, and perhaps you've had opportunity to call, but we, we spoke to them yesterday um, on the phone, and, and uh, they want to come back to church, but are still fighting the coughing and fighting the shortness of breath and, and uh, feeling frustrated with um, different things and not getting answers and all of those things. And, and he's really worn. I don't think he would mind... Sharing And, you know, sometimes it helps if you have specific things to pray about. Um, his night time. If you want to pray for Brother Burka, pray for him to have a good sleep. Okay? Because whatever, whether it's the medication for the clots or whatever it is, he's having a lot of night sweating. Okay? Like on the hour, he has to get up and, and the sheets get changed and he has to change. And imagine if that's happening to you every night. Okay. How, how much good sleep are you getting? And I can't sympathize, but some of you uh, who perhaps are having uh, hot flashes uh, will be able to sympathize um, because Brother Burke, in a sense, is having hot flashes. Okay, for very different reasons. And I don't make to, mean to make light of that. But it's to help us to understand, all right? So he's weary. He's worn. And he needs uh, God's strength. And he needs God's people not to forget about him or his wife, but to keep battling on, right? Because the moment we stop battling, Satan is there to push back. He's not going to leave on his own. And this is this thing that sometimes troubles us. Because I agree, you know, I, when, when Pastor John says, you know, why would anybody do this? What, what is the purpose? What is the benefit? Why did he start this? Okay, speaking now in the natural. Right? So it doesn't make sense. But we have to recognize it's also not probably logical that he's just going to turn around and leave. And Satan, we might say, can't you just leave us alone? As you see all these signs that people are carrying. Just leave us alone. Go away. Leave us alone. Well, the devil says, no. I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to be enslaved by me. And so scripturally, we have weapons and we have things that we need to do. And so in 2 Corinthians... And these are uh, familiar sections of Scripture for the most part, but it's important that we look at them afresh again. Um, and so I'm going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to start at verse 3, where uh, Paul very clearly says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. In other words, we don't fight the same way that the flesh does. Okay? Because as God's people, we recognize there's a different controlling power there. There's an underlying sort of a problem. See, the world often applies a band-aid, right? Here's a symptom, we apply a band-aid, a band-aid, a band-aid. They never can get down to the real root cause of the problem. Because to do that, you have to admit that that root cause of the problem dwells in a spiritual realm, in a supernatural realm. And that's where Satan dwells as well, right? And so he's the one that is the root cause of all of these problems that we see. Sin, not obeying the will of God, right? And then all of these other things that get in 
as people leave the door open. So Paul makes it very clear. And you see, part of what um, Paul is doing here, just as a bit of a background, Paul was being chastised. Paul was being uh, evil spoken of by other Christians because they didn't think that he was powerful enough. They didn't think he was being aggressive enough. They didn't think that he was being forceful enough. Okay? And so they were questioning his authority. And Paul was trying to make it clear, particularly here to the church in Corinth, that this wasn't about being naturally um, loud or violent or forceful. This was about being spiritually powerful and about being uh, at war with the enemy, which in fact is Satan. And so Paul takes a completely different sort of shot at this, a different way of looking at things. And we have to be very, very careful, right? Because our natural instinct is to strike out physically. And there's a time for that when I look at the Bible. But it's always under God's direction. And it can't be under just my emotional sort of feelings. And so Paul says, you know, we don't fight the way that all the other people around us are fighting. And then we recognize in, in verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And he's reminding God's people that you and I, we have access to weapons that are much more powerful than any nuclear weapon or any um, flamethrower, bullet, or whatever other thing you want to name. doesn't matter what man makes or what the devil does. God is more powerful. And, and so... Not, God doesn't keep those things in a closet just for himself, these weapons, that ability. But he says, through the Lord, and that's where really in, in verse 4, that through God, that little two, those two little words there are really, really, really important. Okay? And when we sing the chorus, those two words are actually not in there, are they? Right? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they are mighty, they are mighty. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they are mighty. Okay? And then it talks about, it does, I guess, talk about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost. But we have to make sure that part is first and foremost. Okay? Because I don't care how mighty you are physically and naturally, you're going to get cut down by any of these natural weapons. Right? And we're going to get cut down by Satan. Unless we use the Lord and his strength. And it tells us then in verse 5 that with these weapons that are not carnal, he says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when our obedience is fulfilled. Let me just go back, go down to this verse 6 that I just finished reading. It's that last piece there, when your obedience is fulfilled, that is kind of important here. See, we want to see Satan defeated. Every one of us, I'm sure. We want to see the enemy defeated. Every one of us, I'm sure. But we have to be in the place where God can use us and where we have taken care of what the Lord says we need to do so that then God can move forward through his people into that victory. Okay? And I'm taking that from verse 6, right? You see, anything above that really doesn't take place until it says when your obedience is fulfilled. That's when, at that point in time, now you're useful. Now you're ready. 
now you can be used in the battle that the Lord is looking to wage. So, you know, the world today, you're going to see, and that's not a bad thing, I believe, um, people turn to the Lord, people praying, maybe not as many, probably not as many as should be, all right, but none of that is necessarily effectual unless the people themselves have given their hearts over to the Lord and they become servants of the Lord, right? So, you know, if, if there's an imminent threat to our community and the church suddenly fills up with people, well, that's great, but are they all coming in safe? Are they all coming in prepared to, to change their ways so that God can have his way? Not necessarily so. Okay? And so what Paul is saying here is, once again, kind of a repeat message. You better look at yourself, and you better get yourself in order. Get your house in order. Make sure your house is in order before you can really strike out and, and help the Lord with other things. Okay? Um, and so while God is there and can do all these things, he does expect us to be prepared to work with him. Colossians chapter 2 continues this theme. And again, it's touching on a chorus that we sing, complete, complete, complete in him. Well, let's look at what that really is talking about. Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. Colossians 2 and 9. From the... Bible, which has now become part of a chorus, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay. Sometimes when you sing that chorus, the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelleth in my Lord. You may say those words, but I don't know, for me certainly it sometimes it sounded a little confusing. What is that talking about? The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelleth in my Lord. And, and so it's really saying that the fullness of God, God is the Godhead, okay, dwelleth bodily in the form of a body, in the form of a person, was in my Lord, in Jesus. So Jesus is the fullness of God bodily represented when he came down to earth, okay, for you and for me. So, um, what we look at here, as this continues, is the fact that it then says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and power. And I find that very assuring. Right? Who is the head of all principalities and power? Is it the people right now that are sitting in these countries with X number of weapons and missiles and nuclear, you know, uh, warheads and all those kind of things. Is it them? Was it them in the past? You know, I say that because I did a little bit of research. I was just curious. Um, you know, how many nuclear warheads do these people have? Who has them? What countries have them around the world? You know, and then so it, it varies. But in 1986, let me just take a quick look. Yes, we were all alive in 1986. In 1986, I think they said there were something like 70,000 nuclear warheads in the world in total. Okay? Now, lucky for you and for me, that's down to about 14,000 now. So we've made a little bit of progress. I say that sarcastically. Um, but there are still thousands and thousands and thousands of these things around. Okay? And that makes people feel powerful because they're weapons of mass destruction. But what did we just finish reading? Okay? We just finished reading that ye are complete in him, speaking of Jesus, speaking of our God, our Father, which is the head of all principalities and power. So the top of the list, greater than all of these powers, all these people who think they're so amazing and powerful, the top of the list is God. Okay? And then... 
it says something that's a little, you know, it's, it's a blessing and is quite amazing that it says that you and I, we are complete in him. So there's a connection going on there, all right? And, and uh, the, the image comes from the original meaning of the word complete. Now, I didn't know this until I did a little bit of searching and, and read a few things. The word complete actually comes from a, originally a word used in nautical terms, okay? So when they were dealing with ships, and they used the term, very fittingly, to describe a ship that was completely, or that was prepared, that was outfitted with all of the equipment that it required in order to have a successful voyage, okay? So a ship that was going on a trip, a voyage, would be considered complete when it had all of the equipment that it needed in order to successfully reach its destination. Can you see how that applies for the promise that God gives to you and to me? We can be complete in Him. We can be equipped we can have everything we need through our Lord in order for us to successfully complete our voyage. And that's such a blessing. That God is there, right? And he says, well, you're going to need this, you're going to need this, you're going to need these things. And then, as we all know, we have to be obedient. We have to be willing to say, yes, Lord, I'll take those things. When you travel, Dan would know this, I think, when you travel on a motorcycle, he's a fellow motorcyclist, I don't know if anybody else here is. My well, sister Schwartz used to ride a motorcycle, she used to tell me about that. Uh, anyway, when you travel on a motorcycle, guess what? You have to be very selective about what you take along. Because there isn't room for all of the other things that you might otherwise throw into the trunk of your car or put into a big trailer or something like that, okay? So your definition of complete when you're driving on a motorcycle is much different than when you're driving in your motorhome. When we are traveling with the Lord, we have to be prepared to take what God tells us to take and let go of some of these other things that we think are so important, okay? Because there isn't any room or necessity for those things. If you are filling your life with the Lord and with God wants, with what God wants you to have, then there should not, must not be any space for all of these other things. And scripture actually moves us in that direction uh, when we start to look, about, look at, and I'm just wanting to make sure now I get the right place in the scripture. Yes, let's go to James chapter 4. We'll jump to that next piece. Because in James chapter 4, it adds to this thought that I was just sharing with you. James 4, beginning at verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That is a very, very blunt statement, right? But it's also something we can all understand. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace... Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted. And this is an interesting thing for the scripture to say. He's saying this to you, to me. Be afflicted. Well, I don't like that. He says, and, and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. There's a lot there. 
Well, it starts off by basically saying, you know, we have to be separate from the world. And I link that to my little analogy or image of going on a trip on a motorcycle. I can't take the real big toolbox. Chances are there's 90% of the things in there I'll never need anyway. Okay? But there are a few specific things that I might pack in a bag. Okay? Those things for you and I on the Christian battlefront, the spiritual battlefront, those things must be what God tells us to take along. And all of these other things, pride and envy and malice and hatred, uh, all of these other things, don't bring them with you. Okay? There's no place for them. They actually clutter things up. And when we come into church, you know, and we come into a service, this is one of the reasons why I really think it's important that before you come in, you're already prayed up. Okay? Like we need to come in ready, prepared, so that God can't, now that's not to say he can't help us to become more prepared, but I mean, if you're bringing in, you know, hatred and malice and envy and jealousy and pride and you already have this negative attitude because, you know, you're wreathing, you're upset about this thing and that thing or whatever, how, how is that going to be at all turned into a positive? You already have yourselves in a, a negative place. Okay. It's just like the battle that's going on right now in Europe, right? If the people in Ukraine that are still there fighting, if they, if they start to think, well, the, the battle's over, We've lost. Guess what? Then it is over. Then they have lost. So they are working very, very hard to try and stay positive and to try and, and uh, you know, be faithful and trust. And as God's people, we have to do that in the spiritual sense, right? That regardless of what we see and how big the trial of the situation comes, we can't let go of the promises that God has given us because if we do that, it's like we're laying down the armor. We're putting aside the weapons that God has told us we can use. And we're putting ourselves in a place where, yes, Satan will come and devour us. Because you're letting him in. Okay? And we cannot give place to him. We cannot let him in. So, in, in this section of scripture here, you know, these things that we have to do about resisting, you know, or submitting ourselves before the Lord and resisting the devil, that's a daily, daily thing. I don't care who you are, all of us, we have to constantly be on guard. I think the, the closest thing I might be able to relate it to is when somebody has an addiction, okay, and, and so no matter where they go, what they do, they have to always be alert. Now, and I'm not, I'm not thinking about like a severe, like a, uh, an addiction to a narcotic, but let's say even like a, a peanut allergy, a bad peanut allergy, you know, somebody, there are some kids and, and people that just the smell of it can set them off, you know, or if they eat it, then they're in really big trouble. Well, that means everything you eat, you can't take a holiday. You have to be constantly on guard, right? Because the one slip up could mean you're dead. And so they have to live their entire life on constant alert. What's in this? What's, is this gonna hurt me? Is this gonna hurt me? Is this okay for me? Is it? And you know what? That's not a bad way for us to be as God's people. Not that I'm saying that's a state of fear, but that's a state of readiness, okay? And I'm just gonna close here and go to uh, 1 Peter, and just very, very quickly, 1 Peter chapter 5. Starting at verse 6. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Many of us, we know that verse very, very well, right? And we've had to use that. But then notice what it says, you know, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may 
devour? Whom resists steadfast in the faith? You see, this is not a once a week. This is not, oh, I don't have to worry about it 80% of the time. I just think about it once in a while. That's not what scripture is telling us there. Okay? It's like every place you go, everything you do, all of the time, recognize Satan is waiting and he is ready to devour. But if I abide with my Lord, if I hold fast to him, if I humble myself, okay, if I recognize I can't do this on my own, but if I call on you, Lord, you're there to help me, then I don't need to be afraid. You'll notice in this listing here of what's being said, right? Be sober, be vigilant. That doesn't say be afraid. That doesn't say be terrified. It just means be alert. Be serious about your Christianity, about the walk that you are in, okay? And that's different than being in constant fear. I'm not saying be afraid of the devil to the place where we are petrified and can't do anything because I'm not saying that because scripture's not saying that. But it is saying be alert and be in it. I, I always think about being a Christian that's realistic because when I see scripture, to me, the Bible is real. Okay? I mean, this is, this is nuts and bolts reality. And so when it says be sober, be vigilant, when it tells me that the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, well, I may be the one he's looking for. I'm among those that he's seeking. So I can't ignore that. But it also means I'm not going to lock myself in a closet in my house and never go out. Okay? I just have to ask God for wisdom and knowledge and recognize ultimately, as I've preached a number of times now, it's all in God's hands. And I still, even this morning, still believe God has a plan. Okay? And so while I don't like to hear about what's happening, and I don't like to hear about the threat of this weapon and that weapon and the other thing, and mostly I don't like to hear about those things because I think about my children and my grandchildren and, and others, right? But when I, when I think about those things, it doesn't mean I'm, I'm petrified. It means that we need to be um, driven, in a sense, to our needs. We need to be driven to the storehouse, which is God's house, where God has the weapons, where God has the shelter, where he has the strength, all of these things, because it tells me, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. God hasn't forgotten his people, as long as we are faithful, right? And as we resist, verse 9, I'll just finish up here, whom resists steadfast in the faith, and, and you might want to underline there, in the faith, that's important, okay? Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world, okay? But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by, Jesus, by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. God has an end game, so to speak. He's got a plan. Uh, I, I would probably like to just stroke out the part about after that ye have suffered a while. Lord, if you can skip over that, I'd be happy, happier. But I'm going to keep my eyes on the goal. See, and really those those last parts there make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And then maybe I'll just read verse 11: To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We've uh, often sung the song, you know, in the twinkling of an eye. Saved in the twinkling of an eye. When the trump. And uh, it was Brian I was talking to on Friday and I said, you know, we say those things, but 
To be perfectly honest, I kind of never thought that it would be in my power. And yet it could be, couldn't it? I mean, there's nobody sitting here. I mean, we don't wish it on anyone. But there's absolutely no guarantee that we'll ever see tomorrow. For many, many reasons. Okay? And whether that's something that falls out of the sky, or the Lord comes and he says, Okay, the trumpet's blowing. Whatever it is. Okay? Again, we, we hear and we know, and as my mind understands, I have to be ready. But... For me, at least, that's becoming more and more real, okay, if I can put it that way. Because when you see everything that's happening, this is not some movie you're watching on television. This is not some fiction that's going on. This is a reality. Okay? These are things that are unfolding around us right now. And through it all, we can say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. And thank you, Lord, for the promises that you've made and that you care for me. And I can come to you and I can say, Lord, I don't know about tomorrow. I really don't. Nobody does. But God knows. God knows about tomorrow. So for today, let's make sure that we've taken care of the business. Okay? And that means... Not pointing fingers at everybody else, but it means, Lord, how about me? Am I ready? Have I made my wrongs right? Am I harboring something? Do I need to work on being more humble? What is it, Lord, that I can do just to be a little bit closer so I can feel the comfort and the peace that you can give? And then, just to wrap up along the lines of what Pastor John was saying, we need to pray for others. In our own community, absolutely. Around the world, right? These, whether they're Christians or not in these countries, we all need salvation. We all need a Savior. And only God knows what tomorrow will bring. So today, I'm thankful that we can worship, that we can pray that we can say thank you, Lord, for another day and that God can meet us if we humble ourselves and open ourselves up to him. Victory in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Lord bless you. Amen.